It's been 15 years since our show first aired, and we're back where it all began. This abandoned summer camp in Muskoka, Canada. After coming close to a full decade without reusing the original format, Total Drama Island is back with a fiery vengeance. With two 13-episode micro-seasons, we're finally returning to Wawanaqua with Chris, Chef, and 16 new contestants to torture. The first part of the 26-episode deal has been revealed miraculously Monday, and so far the reactions to it have been kind of interesting. Being a co-production between Cartoon Network, the BBC, and Chorus Entertainment, there are a few more cooks in the kitchen this time. Did they spoil the broth? That is the question Dan and I will endeavor to answer today. Before we officially delve into the season, there are a few additional things outside of the series direct control that we thought was worthy of addressing. This video is unofficially sponsored by Surfshark VPN. You'll, you'll figure out why in a minute. So, Total Drama has never had immaculate distribution. From the jump, the show's presence in the United States and Canada took precedence, with the majority of the premiere switching off between those two countries. I mean, it would get super chaotic. Sometimes one country would start over the other, it would take a hiatus, and then a month later, the other country would start premiering episodes first. Sometimes the gap would widen, sometimes the gap would shorten. But by the end of a typical season, things would seem to level out. I'm not super well read on the history of Total Drama leaks, but let's just say for a show that has endings dependent on certain countries airing them at certain times, it's kind of important that everyone gets their ducks in a row. A significant drop could have fucked up the bag for everybody. So given this vital information established in the year 2007 regarding the integrity of this game, how do you think they chose to release this revival? They let the whole thing drop on Italian Discovery Plus. Yep. It's all there. It's all there. I'm kind of shocked they allowed something like this to happen in the first place. I mean, this has sort of always been a problem since its debut, with the entire seasons being leaked before their US debut, but most of the time that boiled down to the Canadian airing being leaked first, not a country that didn't even produce the show. This isn't even to mention that they had over 10 years to figure this shit out, and with the advent of streaming and the years of planning for distribution they had ahead of time, they really could have gotten a handle on this. Of course it was going to leak, this is total drama we're talking about. And the fact that it is total drama. A parody of a reality show where serialization is one of the most important aspects of the core of the show as a whole. It makes the whole thing even more embarrassing. I know it's easy to kind of toss their names around, but I actually don't think it's Fresh TV's fault this time. This is actually the doing of Cake Entertainment, the main distributors of the Total Drama franchise. There's a 2.69% chance David Zasloff just felt pettier that day and let the other shoe drop, but you can't convince me he's spending the same amount of time monitoring this franchise as he has been salivating over the new Property Brothers cinematic universe. Anyway, this is... Dumb. I didn't even grow up watching this shit, and even I know how dumb this move is. Italy seems like a big enough market for total drama if the promo work done for Dramarama and the Redonkulous Race are to be believed, but giving them this was probably not worth torpedoing the potential following from the rest of the world. This intro is cringe. That's it. I understand that it's total drama and 90% of this franchise is cornball antics, but it's still cringe. Audibly, it's well put together. It's fine, but it's try hard as fuck. This season has a very different musical motif that it's going for compared to literally every other season, and I suppose that because of that, it only makes sense to change up the theme song as well. But not like this. Why like this? Like, the original theme song talks about hopes and dreams, as well as actually fighting to get where they want to be. This one starts out with the line, Hey, what's up? I'm here to slay. Which isn't necessarily the worst way to open up a theme song, but it sets the absolute wrong mood that this show is going for. They don't even give every character a spotlight in the intro. What a... What an utter mess. Whatever primary cringe rubs off the first time you hear it only gets worse if you end up getting through the season. See, the intro kind of lines up well with the image of the reboot that was sold to us initially. You know, the one with the TikTok challenges and the extreme baking and the drag racing and all of that. The season itself is actually pretty naturalistic. 
It does feel like they plunked a dozen regular contemporary teenagers on the island rather than the stereotypes they originally were. The intro is corny and silly, but it's obviously not in line with what the show's actually doing, and it's also not pushed far enough to really match the absurdist nature that's more familiar with the franchise. Total Drama is low-key above this lame-ass beat and this lame-ass bar. Really, it's just, it's the first bar that most people have a problem with, but it's lame. It's not serving, I fear. It's not very major. It does not slay mama. Cope. By now, you're probably aware of the elephant in the room regarding Chris. The replacement of Christian Potenza as Liquid Jeff Probst was only made public knowledge about two weeks ago with the surprise reveal of a promo for the new season. Terry McGurin, a legacy crew member of Total Drama and the voice of Don from Redonkulous Race, is new Chris. The circumstances regarding this change are murky, but enough people have connected the dots to come up with the most likely scenario at this point. It's a startling change. I'm sure most people won't be getting over it today or tomorrow, and it's understandable to be adverse to embracing it. If it's possible for you to put aside any biases, I'd try to give the new season a chance anyway. Terry's the goat for taking on the role, and the least that can be done is to give his and everyone else's hard work a fair shake. We'll get into the actual performance a bit later, but it felt worthy of addressing here. Before we move on, I just wanted to take a second to praise the animation this season. Total Drama has always been consistently good with their output of animation, and if anything, it's actually increasing quality in regards to things like character animations and facial expressions. Of course, they love to reuse a lot of assets and backgrounds almost every season, but given the premise of the show, it's excusable. This season, they continue to keep the quality of animation to the same level as previous seasons, but they're actually pretty ambitious with some of the things they try to pull off, with the big addition being smear frames, especially for quick hand movements. I'm glad that over 10 years later, they're still trying to find ways to shake things up in the visual department. Millie is an interesting character on paper, but in execution, there's a lot to be desired. When she's introduced, her whole shtick is that she psychoanalyzes everyone from the corner and sets herself up as a non-threat, sort of like another character that we'll talk about later. The problem is that she manages to do basically nothing most of the time, at some points even just opting out of challenges and relying on others to overcome obstacles. Despite this, she still makes it extremely far, and honestly, she kind of doesn't deserve to make it as far as she did. Still, she has some moments, but I can't help but feel with a little retooling or development, she could be an extremely valuable character. Bowie surprised me a lot this season. During the first episode or two, I was certain that he wasn't going to be written very well, but I'm glad to be as wrong as I was. He's actually one of the most resourceful and interesting characters of the entire lot. He's paired up against, like, doomsday preppers and total drama automatons and shit, but the whole time I was just kind of focused on what his next move was. Like, he's here to play the game, but he's just as reasonable as a lot of people watching. The way that he handled Raj was expert. It would have been totally easy for him to just carelessly backstab anybody with a pulse. But he didn't do that here. He's not even really a villain. He occupies a similar role, but he doesn't really feel evil or nothing. I'm not gonna pretend like they had the most fleshed out romance ever, cause like, 13 episodes, hello. But they handled it about as well as they could have. Bowie is the first openly gay, black, total drama contestant. Which is cool. I ended up starting uh, Survivor Kageon maybe like a day or two after I finished the season, and as it turns out, there is somebody in there that may have served as Bowie's direct likeness. We didn't get to know him very well because he was eliminated maybe like four episodes deep, but it seemed kind of obvious to me that he was the reference material, which I thought was cool. Kageon wasn't that long ago. It definitely feels like it because... They, they made like 40 seasons in 20 years. But I did like seeing more of the source material for Total Drama itself being reflected in this new season. And of course being funneled into a character who is just as likable as he is devious. Chase is a character that could have so easily been botched. He's sort of like the TD Universe's Logan Paul in that he lives in a big house with his friends who all pull pranks on one another and uploads the results for internet clout. His whole gimmick is that he's woefully ignorant to everyone around him, especially towards Emma, his ex-girlfriend. 
He's also extremely selfish and narcissistic, to the point where he convinces himself that he's still in a relationship with Emma after cutting the brakes to her car and making her crash through a pet store. He has a very similar personality structure to a character like Dave from Pocketoo Island, who is easily one of the worst characters in the show. Like, fuck Dave, all of my homies hate Dave. But whereas Dave had this massive crutch and almost no redeemable qualities in his escapades of attracting Sky, at the very least, Chase is entertaining in exactly how ignorant he actually is. Hey, not so bright guy that no one wants. You're with me. Let's move. When people insult your intelligence, it means they can't find anything wrong with the way you look. Maybe it's just me, but I've always found playfully empty-headed characters to be very charismatic in just how full of themselves they really are. I can understand how people hate Chase, he does not make it difficult to do so, but I think he was one of the more underrated characters this time around, purely based on the entertainment factor. And he played a strong social game too, hitting it off with almost all the guys. Definitely deserved to make it as far as he did. Emma was fine, I suppose. I don't think the shtick of her constantly running around and seething and loathing Chase was quite as much content as they thought it was, but I, I appreciate the effort. She does kind of blend in with a, a few other characters from a few seasons past, but she's not completely irredeemable. Her more interesting moments came out of the selfie challenge, and predictably so, her relationship with Bowie is kind of interesting to see develop. Caleb is touted as the most attractive man in the world for, like, the third time in this show's history. Honestly, there really isn't much to say about Caleb this time around. We really don't get to know him all that well. His character served more as the jumping off point for Bowie's long game than it did to any actual development. I have to think this is a bit of an inside joke based on how the first character out is always severely underdeveloped based on the very little dialogue he has during his elimination and the finale. Anyways, yeah, that's Caleb. Hotter than Justin, but can't even match Alejandro's suave personality. Damien is just the toontastic Tyler jump scare, and I mean that in a very literalized sense. They stole his drip, but they also kind of just stole his general mannerisms. Like, if Bro had never touched Total Drama at all before being plunked on Wawa and Aqua, this is, this is pretty much how the shit would go down. His life is basically a sitcom. Predictably so, I kind of like seeing him on screen. I don't really get what his general angle is. He's kind of a nerd, but kind of not. Other than just being bewildered that Total Drama is indeed a thing. There's not much there, not much meat on that bone, but I fuck with it. You know, it's, pr it's pretty funny. In the raw context of what it is, pretty funny character. Mary-Kate, or MK for short, makes it clear from the very beginning what kind of game she's playing. She tries to fly under the radar for her entire run on the show, never showing off and painting a target on her back, but also never being the reason that her team is up for elimination. She's also a bit of a pickpocket, which falls in line with her constantly being underestimated. Another aspect that coincides with this is her being able to view everyone else's confessionals by jerry-rigging a cell phone. I actually like this strategy a lot, and it almost works out for her. She's kind of similar to Millie, in that she also flies under the radar, but unlike Millie, she actually puts in the effort to make sure that she's not targeted. There's a strategy to her game, and a pretty good one at that, albeit her sarcasm can sometimes overtake her purposefully subdued nature. Kinda shocked that she didn't last longer, she would've been a great villain. But we have that role saved for someone else. Z is the goodest of boys, he is the bestest of best. I have not cared this much about a total drama character in the past. He's so good, he's so funny, extremely laid back. I was wondering if it was gonna come into conflict with any personalities we had seen before, because a laid back character in and of itself is not exactly a total drama trademark, but it's been done before. And Z is completely different. Some people figured out through promo footage that Z is actually missing one of his legs. And the inverse reveal and subsequent explanation of what what's the deal with that is fucking golden. I've never been so won over by a character in this show before. He's just perfect. Is there a reason you never told us one of your legs was a prosthetic? Probably the same reason you never told me your legs weren't. Fair enough. The way that they eliminated him was so ass, too. It was clearly a rug pull. They just needed a reason to get rid of him. It was totally unjustified. I will never forgive them for that. Julia is this season's Heather, and I mean that in more ways than one. 
She's introduced as one of those yoga-loving, positive-vibes-only influencers, but it's quickly revealed that this is all just a facade, a ruse if you will. She was pulling the wool over all of our eyes. From here on in, she turns into the mean, spoiled rich girl who makes everyone else's lives a living hell, turning into this season's de facto villain. She also loves calling people butt knuckles, and I know this show has gotten a lot more TVY7 as the years go on, but they really couldn't come up with a better insult? I mean, whatever. It's very clear that they're trying to make her this season's Heather, but while she definitely has the same teenage swagger as the OG, she's definitely lacking in the strategy department. That's not to say she makes no power plays, she's actually a very strong competitor, winning the most challenges post-merge. But she doesn't really have a plan B or C. And because of that, and the fact that she is the main villain this time around, she needed to make it far. As such, like Heather before her, she has a very heavy set of plot armor to make sure she wins when she needs to. This can be excused with Heather, as it was the first season, and keeping her around gave us more development of how low she'd go. But we never really got to that level with Julia. What's worse, she has even thicker plot armor in some of the eliminations she avoids, but more on that later. Like Millie, I think she'd benefit from some development, but at the very least, the mold is there. Nichelle was really interesting to me off the bat. There's a not insignificant part of Total Drama Twitter that was convinced that she would win the million dollar prize because she was just serving. She's just giving that type of energy off. She has to win. And I mean, I, I, I get why, but I felt like she would have been an early elimination and surprise, surprise, it, it took like three episodes to get her out of here. I felt like her time on the show was actually not swinging in the direction that one would expect. You know, I mean, she's uh, an internationally known celebrity. She's a, a supposed action star. And she's also kind of a bitch. That's kind of the point. OMG, I am literally the biggest fan ever! Okay. Yet, for her time on the show, it's, it's shown that she's an, an effective communicator. She's a leader. She's able to play hype man when she needs to. She actually has decent skills. If they put her on actual Survivor, she would get pretty far. She would definitely make it post-merge. So regardless of her reasons for actually being there, maybe her publicist set her up to him, maybe it was voluntary, it felt like she actually had the chops to be a decent competitor. I was kind of disappointed when they got rid of her. Though I will say, her elimination was one of the few to make real sense to me. And the scene that justified her elimination was <laughs> fucking hilarious. I, I would like to see more of her though. If not here, then in other total drama media. This might actually be kind of wasted potential here if you can believe it. Ripper rips ass. That's, um, that's, that's basically the whole gist of his character. To be fair, there's actually more to his character than just that, and he is a very determined challenger, but farting is literally in his name. If he's on screen, there's a 90% chance he's either farting or talking about farting. Not only that, but he's extremely rude to everyone who shows the slightest tinge of intelligence, as he loves throwing the nerd insult around, which I mean, hey, it's better than butt knuckle. Despite all that, he makes it surprisingly far, and I think I have a theory as to why this is the case. My guess would be that, given his mannerisms, he's sort of like a character to call out the fans who think Owen is nothing more than a fart joke, despite his popularity. Truth of the matter is that Ripper, despite his simplistic nature, is easy to produce content, and whenever Ripper's not on screen, all the other characters should be asking, where's Ripper? As such, he definitely makes a name for himself, whether that be a good thing or not. He never really bothered me personally, I can appreciate how they actually tried to make him at the very least a competent player, but I definitely think he overstayed his welcome. Axel was a real red herring in ways that you could kind of feel before she officially got the boot. Like, there's always a couple hyper-competent, overly prepared contestants each time. But her being felt so generic, I was kind of like, oh yeah? Yeah? It's funny since during her introduction, there's a, a stealth cameo from Sean, the first zombie prepper from Pakatu Island. And I felt like that was kind of like, hmm, hmm. She came to serve, but she had nothing to serve had a similar breadth of knowledge and some leadership skills the same way Nichelle did, but definitely more of a chaotic force to be reckoned with. Basically just Eva, but updated for the new generation. Didn't get to know her very well. Didn't really grip me the time that she was there. Wayne and Raj are two hockey players dropped on the island. 
despite initially coming across as a bit brash and mean-spirited, they're just as goofy and fun-loving as many other previous contestants. The season didn't delve too deep into their friendship, but it's clear that they're extremely close. Basically, two golden retrievers thrown into sports jerseys. I can appreciate how both Wayne and Raj have their own story arcs that are both separate from one another, but also somehow loop back into each other in some way. They may dress and talk the same, but these two are their own unique characters, and I think that they nailed it for the first time when it comes to pair characters. It's so weird how they advertise Lauren as Scary Girl, given that she actually has a name, but actually thinking back now, despite her introduction, I don't think she's ever been referred to as anything other than Scary Girl. So you know what, just screw it, I'll just call her that too. Scary Girl has been an enigma ever since her initial reveal. Amongst the relatively subtle and laid-back character designs, Scary Girl was... not... that. When we actually get to see Scary Girl in the show, I, yeah, it's basically exactly what they advertised. She's a, um... She's a scary girl who likes blood and guts and bones and death and traumatizing people. For how long she's in the game, she's actually able to pull her own weight when push comes to shove, but for the most part, while everyone else is playing total drama, she's off in her own world, with her own intentions. She very much feels like a leftover from Pocketu, both in design and demeanor, but that's actually not necessarily a bad thing, at least not this time around. The big problem with Pocketu is that basically every character was a cartoon character with a cartoon character gimmick, and with almost no one grounded in reality, there was no one for the audience to latch onto, and there was nothing for the show to latch onto for it to be a well, a reality show. With this season, almost every character, despite having some exaggerated personalities, is at the very least tethered to the TD plane of reality. Scary Girl is the exception to this rule, and as such, she stands out amongst the other players, but this is actually to her benefit instead of her detriment. Who knows what Scary Girl is thinking? If you're gonna hide a body, clap your hands. If you're gonna hide a body, clap your hands. We even get to see some development for her, albeit under the veil of having to abide by Scary Girl's logic. Definitely a pleasant surprise, and one of the standouts of this season, at least to me. Priya had a pretty decent role to fill. She was kind of hyped up to be the, the ultimate new age total drama player. Her parents had been training her from early, early on to figure out every possible way to beat the game. Which is definitely more interesting than what they tried to do with Axel but she was still kind of built up to be like a, an every girl. The main arc she had was concerning her relationship with Millie, one of the more passive contestants that allows her to basically get carried by Priya through a fair amount of the show up until later where she starts to pull her own weight and they, they have more of a fruitful friendship. They do that thing that they do where there's a, a big lie, a misunderstanding that breaks through and it breaks everybody up for a little bit except that's shoved in like the final moments of the 12th episode, and it, it definitely feels rushed because most of the finale has been trying to resolve that. It's okay. We kind of needed that based on how the season was going anyway, but I do kind of wish they did something a little different with Priya. Her whole shtick is just knowing exactly how Total Drama is played in and out. She's the ultimate survivor. She can win the million dollar prize 12 times in a row in the exact same season. But this doesn't really address what kind of damage this might have caused her as a person. Like, she's a little awkward. I mean, she quirky though, but we don't get as much of a peek behind the curtain as I would have liked. There's definitely not as much done with her as I would have liked, but there's still more than enough meat on that bone to get you hooked into the action. Chris and Chef are close enough to blank slates in this season. They feel more like co-parents than sadistic reality TV show hosts. The former especially doesn't have much of an edge on him compared to what came before. It's kind of like Garfield was in his place with a dash of modern day Peter Griffin. He's just moderate snark here, I'm not really getting the sadism. Chef was ported directly from Dramarama, operating more or less as a beleaguered daycare worker that can occasionally put his foot down more than he did with literal four year olds. I like that he's the voice of reason here, he actually has differing opinions on how things should be run. It's not an antagonistic relationship by any means, but it's nice to see the relationship being characterized a bit differently here. Now, obviously, Chris and Chef do not share the same voice actors that they did so long ago, 
The original voice of Chef was replaced uh, quite a while ago, and we've had a whole other spinoff to get used to the new sound, but Chris's new voice is debuting here, and to be honest, it's not too distracting. There's nobody that can really match that iconic sound that Chris had. But I wouldn't say this new portrayal is offensive either. The personalities of these two men are significantly pulled back, and while not an intentional creative choice, the nature of these two sounding different, maybe a bit softer in approach, is a pretty serendipitous way of signaling that things are different here. Understandably, Chris is probably a big part of what people enjoy about the wacky nature of total drama, and while you're not getting a lot of chaos from him, this doesn't come at a detriment to what's being presented. Being a micro season, it's not easy to say that we've had development comparable to the original trilogy. Even with a fresh slate of interesting personalities, it's easy enough for things to get lost in translation. It had a decent mix of stronger characters and focus next to more passive background standees. Saying that, there's a few things I would possibly tweak. I'd say the strongest chemistries that we've seen were the ones that were basically pre-established before this season even began, those being Wayne and Raj, and Chase and Emma. Wayne and Raj could have easily gone down the route of someone like Katie and Sadie, or Amy and the other one, both in design and demeanor, but I'm happy to report that there's actually some diversity in both regards. Not only that, but they proved to be integral to almost all of the challenges that they participate in, with them basically taking the reign and being major contributing factors to their victories. Chase and Emma is a bit of a strange one, and I can totally see not enjoying the characters' dialogue and interactions. Not gonna lie, the way things were left off when the season ended, it definitely didn't seem like the best way to end their storylines, especially for Emma. But I'm also not gonna pretend that their quote, relationship, wasn't entertaining to watch. On our anniversary, I went to one of those star registry places and named a star after you. He named the star Chase's girlfriend. Uh. <gasps> Yikes! I've explained this so many times. The plan was to legally change your name to Chase's girlfriend. It was a two-part gift. Every time you talk, you become a worse person. The other characters had a base chemistry, but they definitely needed some more development. Raj and Bowie marked the first gay romance in the series, and I'd say it's handled with grace and dignity. That being said, there isn't much going on there, as we barely get any development before a certain elimination. Bowie and Emma was one of the earliest alliances in the game, and they had a promising start, but it quickly devolved into the whole thing revolving around Chase, and I was kind of hoping there'd be more to Emma's character than just Chase, and Priya and Millie. Look, I think it's a very cute friendship, and I do really like Priya, and I think Priya helps make Millie a better person, but their relationship really boils down to Priya carrying the two of them through almost everything. They try and have this storyline of Millie needing to learn to actually participate and fight for herself, but it happens a bit too late, and even then she overstays her welcome. Not to say any of these pairings are bad, these are still pretty good as far as the show goes, I just think that with a bit more time and development, they could blossom into something even better. The only real complaint I had was related to the eliminations. Most of the time it felt like the choices for who to cap were contrived to the nines. Like, they went with the less logical choice, solely to throw the audience a curveball. There were very few times where I felt the elimination was truly earned, despite the fidelity of each character. In the long run, it seemed to work out, since the elimination order itself made a lot of sense. It's just the justification that threw me off. Yeah, some of the justifications for these eliminations made no sense at all. Elimination logic has always been a bit of an eyebrow raiser for as long as the show has been around, but some of the choices here contest even the worst of the first season. Ripper has always been in the bottom two every single time he's been up for elimination, and yet he still somehow makes it to the final eight, which is kind of insane given that his, I don't even want to call it a story arc for, for what he goes through, but that thing that he was in ended in episode five of the season. Z made it pretty far too, which y you love to see, Z is just amazing. But the reasoning behind his elimination is also one of the bigger leaps in logic, to say the least. The worst one, by far in my opinion, has to be episode 6, where MK was eliminated over Julia. Not to say that she didn't deserve it based on what she pulled off, but by the time the elimination was starting, basically everyone had had enough of Julia, and when Julia came around trying to prove that MK had recorded everyone's confessionals and stole their stuff, 
they still don't believe her before voting time. Yet, the writers clearly had bigger plans for her villain arc, because against all odds, she remained safe and MK was headed home. Julia definitely improved over time, but if you're going to try and get a character out of a tight situation, you gotta come up with stronger points. Alright, so I would recommend skipping this section if you're halfway through the season and or haven't taken a liking to it yet. The details we're about to go over aren't game-breaking, but they do deserve their own disclaimer for a reason. Just trust us on this one. Okay, so the finale itself was pretty bog standard as far as total drama seasons go. I don't think any formal mention of alternate endings have been made, but with the way the race to the finish line was staged, it certainly looks like they're planning to use them. At the tail end, right after the winners presented with the grand prize, Chris informs the cast that they're all invited back for a rematch, a mechanic never previously implemented before. They're so stoked they have the dance party ending. <laughs> it's iconic. So this twist raised quite a few points that should likely be addressed. Something like this has not really happened before. At best, you have the reunion specials to account for, but that's about it. We've never seen a full cast straight up brought into back-to-back -back seasons to compete twice. Having each game being a 13-episode micro-season only underscores this more. There's less time to make big plays and have characters get to know each other, so this might actually prove to be beneficial. There's plenty of characters we're hoping to see more of the next go-round. I, for one, think this is a very good call on their part. With all the characters we went over today, none of them were outright bad, but a lot of them need a lot more time to come into their own. With a full-on rematch season, we can see a lot of characters in a new light, as well as get some more focus on characters that never really got the chance to shine. There's a small chance that the scheduling issue might actually be corrected. Assuming there's a brief hiatus between the two parts, it gives Cake some time to fix things. If we can maybe get an early summer release for part one in North America, that'd be great. If we can get part two before Italy, that'd be even better. But that might be wishful thinking at this point, because it was why, why, why the fuck would you even let this happen in the first place? Overall, the first round of Total Drama Island 2023 left me pleasantly surprised. For as subdued or vanilla as it can feel at times, it made a lot of solid choices without making everything feel too safe. A big draw of the franchise has to be the rampant chaos at play, which I don't think this one was really bringing. It's cartoonish, but relatively down to earth as far as raw mechanics go. Despite that, it doesn't feel like a huge loss or anything. Total Drama Island 2023 has so far proved that modern refreshes and updates can shine without making the source material feel outdated. I think, I think as long as we manage to get that intro subbed out with the original, we'll all be fine here. I'm not a hater. I'm a concerned citizen. A lot of us were definitely nervous as to how the show was going to pull off total drama in the current year. And while I don't think it came out completely unscathed of criticism, what we got was a surprisingly solid season, and dare I say, probably in the upper echelon of seasons. I wouldn't call it better than Island, World Tour, or Redonkulous Race, but it's definitely better than All Stars, Pocket 2, and even Action. I'd say it's almost the same level as Revenge of the Island, maybe a bit better though. Really, it all boils down to the strong cast we have this time around, and I cannot wait to see them return again for the rematch season. Caleb's going all the way, baby. We get to do it all again next season on Total Drama!